Mental health is a huge problem, and most of my friends are really struggling. We are constantly stressed. We go to school for seven hours a day, have extracurricular activities, work in piles of homework and tests and study for. Yet adults wonder why we're always so tired. I think it would be helpful for people to understand that teenagers are trying their hardest. Students my age have very high expectations of themselves. Sometimes all we need is the offer of support as necessary, as well as letting us figure out things for ourselves. It's hurtful when parents don't trust their kids. Behavior you condemn or criticize could be the result of stressors, so it's best to look beyond the behavior and more so to the well-being of the student. Even the smallest critiques can cut deep. A lot of us are depressed and a lot of us hide it really well. Mental health matters over everything else. Thank you everyone for being here. I'd like to welcome you all to the third annual Critical Conversations event sponsored by the Mental Health and Wellbeing Task Force, formerly known as the Substance Abuse Task Force. I am Paula Morano, the proud Assistant Superintendent and Chairperson of the Mental Health and Wellbeing Task Force. And I'm honored to be with all of you tonight to discuss this very important topic impacting so many of our students and families. It is clear from both the qualitative and quantitative data that our students are struggling with stress, anxiety, and depression now more than ever. Last night, a school committee member asked if this is truly an increase in mental health, mental health challenges or if students are just more aware and reporting it more. That's a great question, and frankly, I don't have an answer, but hopefully maybe one of our panelists can answer that for us tonight. What I do know, though, is students are hurting and that given the lack of mental health resources, Parents and school staff are feeling helpless and frustrated. We as a community need to come together to listen to our students' stories, support them, model and teach them the coping skills to reduce their stressors and be able to live successful and joyful lives. When you leave this program this evening, we are hopeful that you, the adults and community members, will better understand what our students are experiencing and leave with some tools and resources to help your students develop their own coping skills and go from surviving to thriving. I would like now to introduce Jen Knight Levine, the CEO and co-founder of the SAFE Coalition, who will inform us of what she hears and hears from our students and community members regarding mental health and substance use. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight. It is an absolute pleasure to be back here at Franklin High School, where I graduated in 2004, to talk about this incredibly important conversation around mental health and substance use with our adolescents. <clears throat> so tonight, I hope that as we're here, as I'm speaking, as Nicole is speaking, as our panelists are speaking, that we can take a deep breath and kind of reflect on our own lives and the own, our own teens and adolescents that we know. I am from Franklin, I live in Franklin now, and when I was growing up here, my childhood was amazing. I have great parents, I have great neighbors, I played sports, and it was a really wonderful opportunity for me to move back here a few years ago. And when I moved back, I don't think I really had the insight yet as to what our adolescents would be dealing with a few years down the line. So I was introduced as the co-founder and COO, or CEO of the SAFE Coalition. And for those of you who don't know, the SAFE Coalition is a nonprofit organization that provides support to teens and families at no cost who are impacted by mental health, substance use, domestic violence, and sexual assault. Coming out of the pandemic and working with our school partners, specifically the Franklin Public Schools, we recognized quickly that substance use and mental health concerns among our middle and high school aged youth was skyrocketing. Many students were struggling with grades, many students were struggling with healthier relationships. We saw substance use increasing in school and at school events, and so we really wanted to do something. And so one of the really wonderful opportunities that we had was to create a diversion program. So we have an opportunity for adolescents in middle school and high school to go to an educational program for substance use and mental health to learn about 
why they're struggling with mental health and substance use concerns. And over the past few months, we've been collecting some data. And I want to share a little bit of these statistics with you. Of the students that we've worked with this past year, starting in November, 55.8% of students say that they use multiple times a day with substances. 64% of those students believe that the substances are not healthy. And 63.5% of those students believe that a certain event in their life impacts their substance use. 71.2% of students struggle with anxiety and depression. 82.7% of students have a family history of addiction. 98.1% of students believe substances are harmful. But the biggest and most incredible fact here is that 92.3% of students have attempted to decrease their substance use on their own. What we know from these statistics and what we know from working with our students and their families in our vaping diversion program is that these students are trying to quit on their own. They know that their su these substances are harmful for them. And at the end of this three-day program, all of these kids are able to access the understanding that the reason why they're using substances be is because they're struggling with their mental health concerns. What we've realized over the past few years is that many of the families that walk through our door absolutely want the best for their children. They worked really hard, they got good jobs, they have really great health insurance, they have the house with the garage, and they work really, really hard to make sure that their children have the best opportunities for their future. And this consistent theme of mental health continues to move through households. And it's the one big thing that not a lot of us are talking about. And one of the focuses that we have here tonight is that once you leave, you have a deeper understanding, one, about what our youth in this community are up against, and two, a few solutions on how to manage that. We hope tonight that you do not feel alone, that if you feel like your loved one or your family fall under any of these statistics, that these were collected in this community with families just like yours, with students just like yours, with students who are athletes and National Honor Society members, who are on the drama club and in mock trials, that mental health and substance use challenges are not a character flaw. They're an opportunity for all of us to dig a little bit deeper and learn a little bit more about each other. I am so thankful that all of you are here tonight because of the incredible lineup that we have. The next speaker that I'm about to present is Nicole Claremont. Nicole Claremont is a good friend of mine and I had the opportunity of meeting Nicole when she was a student at FHS. A little bit about Nicole. Nicole grew up in Franklin, Massachusetts and she was raised by her mom, Mary, father, Chris, and her two older brothers, Corey and Ryan. Nicole graduated from Franklin High School in 2018 and had a four-year varsity <clears throat> track and was a four-year varsity track and field and cross-country runner, serving as a captain of cross-country her junior and senior year and captain of track and field her senior year. Nicole holds the school record for the 4x800 in the 5K and was the 11-time ta Hockamock champion, three-time Hockamock League MVP, and national qualifier. During her time at FHS, Nicole was a member of the Spanish National Honor Society, Peer Leader Group, 40% Club, and the SAFE Coalition. After high school, Nicole attended Boston College and ran varsity, cross country, and track and field for the Eagles. During her time on the Heights, Nicole was the 2019 USATF Junior Cross Country <laughs> Champion, earning her the opportunity to race for Team USA at the 2019 IAAF World Cross Country Championships. Nicole was a part of the BC Student Athlete Advisory Committee as the Marketing and Communications Director from 2019 through 2022. Nicole graduated from Boston College Magna Cum Laude in May 2022 with a bachelor's degree in Applied Psychology and Human Development and a minor in Physiology. Nicole worked at the Hockamock YMCA as a camp counselor and the director of Choose to Be Nice. Nicole is now pursuing her master's in Theology at the University of Notre Dame as part of the ECHO Graduate Service Program. Nicole currently holds Nicole currently works at St. Peter the Apostle Church in River Edge, New Jersey, as a faith formation associate as she pursues her master's degree. I am very excited tonight to bring up and invite Nicole Claremont to the stage. Hi, 
Hi, everyone. First, I want to start off by saying thank you to Jen Knight for inviting me to be here tonight to speak. Jen has been such a role model and inspiration to me, and I'm just truly so honored to be here. I also want to thank Paula Morano for coordinating this event and making it possible. Um, this is such an important conversation that I'm all really glad you're here for. And I also want to give a round of applause to the audience, to everyone who showed up tonight. That's really big for you to be here. And yeah, I just want to say thank you for coming. <laughs> Nicole, you're the anchor leg. It was my senior year, dual meet versus Mansfield High School, four by 400. Coach put me at anchor because he knew I could take the team home to a victory. Travato gave me an aggressive race plan. Get out the first 200 meters extremely hard, harder than you think. As a distance runner, the 400 was a sprint. I got the baton and shot out like a cannon. I listened to coach like I always did. I took his advice and I ran with it. The first 100 meters, I started closing the gap. By the 120 meter mark on the back straightaway, I had gained on my competitor and gotten, oh, gotten past her. I felt so great. I was accomplishing my goal. I was gonna win this race. I passed the 200 meter mark and heard someone yell, 27. I was shocked. That was a personal best in the 200 meters and I was running a 400 meter race. I thought to myself, how am I gonna finish this race? Around the turn at the 300 meter mark, my legs started to feel a little heavy. I turned the final turn and I saw the swarm of my teammates cheering me on with love. At the 100 meter mark, I thought to myself, you got this, Nicole. 90 meters to go. Legs starting to feel like jello. 80 meters. The noise of the crowd echoes. 70 meters. How close is this finish line? 60 meters. Am I going to finish this race? 50 meters to go. My legs are losing control. 40 meters. Stay on your feet, Nicole. 30 meters to go. Oh no. 20 meters. Come on, Nicole, fight. 10 meters. Bam. I hit the track. The baton goes flying. The Mansfield girl passes me. I watched her whiz by me as I frantically stood up, grabbed the baton, and muscled my way across the finish line with all my heart. I finished the race and immediately felt ashamed embarrassed. Tears welled in my eyes as my teammates hugged me and embraced me. I apologized for letting the team down. One of my teammates said, Nicole, today I realized that I can relate to you. You're not perfect. You're human. Just as I did in this race, let's hit the ground running. Growing up, I was the youngest child looking up to my two older brothers, Corey and Ryan. I was always trying to hang. I wanted to be strong, just like them. They made me tough. I was a natural competitor. We didn't watch Disney Channel or princess movies. We watched ESPN. At age one, I was in a bucket seat at the Marlboro rink. Age four, I knew how to operate the claw machines. Age five, I was a mascot for Pop Warner football. Age six, I started youth soccer. Sports were my life. Sports became a safe haven for me. They became a way for me to express myself and find my identity. Beginning of my freshman year of high school, I was on the freshman soccer team. I joined the soccer team because I've been playing my whole life. That was my first experience of a challenge with sport. I didn't quite feel like I fit in. I was a part of the leftover crew and not the populars. I wasn't the best player on the team. I didn't have the best foot skills, but I was happy to be with my teammates. Some of them I had known for a while. I was happy to have a few friends starting high school. I felt like I was enough, like I belonged. My coach liked me. I put my best foot forward and I played hard. I had no idea what was in store for me for the rest of high school. Freshman soccer was my first experience where I felt burned out. Burnout is a state of exhaustion of physical or emotional strength 
or motivation, usually as a result of prolonged stress or frustration. I had been playing soccer for eight years. I was ready to try something new. My mom was an all-American runner at Army West Point, a star in the 400 and 800. I thought, why don't I go out for track? She never pressured me. She allowed me to try it for myself. My first mile, I ran 613 at the Reggie Lewis Center. I remember my brother was there and my family too. Corey even posted about me on Instagram. I was feeling so happy and proud of myself. I truly felt like I had a skill for something. I felt like people noticed me. I kept up with it, and Coach Trovato gave me all the opportunities in the world that I could ever dream of. He saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. He believed in me and invited me to be a part of the 4x800 team that qualified for the all-state meet. I was alongside junior Brittany Robinson and two fellow freshmen who have become my best friends, Kate Hartnett and Ella Gukowski, who I still talk to to this day. I remember thinking to myself, how cool is this? Nothing in my life up until this point made me feel so excited outside of running. Running became the light of my life that spring. I really started to see that maybe I could be really good at this. Not only did we qualify for the state meet that year, we qualified for nationals. We got the backpacks. I finished the season, ended up running a 524 mile, third in the league. I was pretty proud of myself, but mostly I was proud of my team. I felt like I was really doing something with my life. It gave me purpose. Now I had a decision to make. Was I going to run cross country in the fall or do soccer? The decision seemed hard at the moment, but it was pretty obvious cross country was my destiny sophomore year. I want you to think back to a time in your life where you started something new and you were a natural. Feels pretty good to be a natural, right? I was riding a high. Sophomore cross country was one of the best times in my life. I was free like a bird, no pressure or expectations, just joy. I truly loved running. And I felt like I had the opportunity to really let that shine alongside my teammates. Franklin High School track was truly something special. We had an incredible team culture that we built on PMA, positive mental attitude. I was supported that felt like, by people that felt like my family. I was really good at running and that felt amazing. I was known as Nicole, the good runner. What felt even better was that people I got to do it with. We got to win the Hockamock League Championship that year. I went into the first state meet and did really well. My family was really happy and proud of me. I finished the race on two feet. As the youngest child, I learned a lot from my two older brothers. I pursued perfection in everything I did. I wanted to be liked. I didn't want people to worry about me. I felt invincible. I was running fast and winning. I was well liked and supported by teammates and coaches. The only pressure I experienced at that time was the pressure I put on myself. I wanted to be better. I was extremely diligent in my training and in my schoolwork. You could always find me studying, practicing, or getting the proper rest and nutrition for the next day. I never got involved in drinking or drugs or other risky behavior in high school. My focus was solely track. My identity was runner. Everything I did revolved around it. For better or for worse, all my friends were on the track team, and outside of school, all I thought about was running. I didn't know myself outside of the sport, but at the time, that was okay. My junior year of high school, the success continued. I finished fourth at the All-State Meet and repeated as the league champion. Our team won for the second year in a row. I was confident, unafraid, myself, team captain. Indoor season, we reached new heights in the thousand meters. We qualified for nationals again, this time in the champion section. I felt like I knew myself, good athlete, good person, good family, good friends. All was good until puberty hit, the summer going into my senior year. I was no longer in control. I like making a race plan for every race. 
I thought to myself, how can I plan for puberty? I started to notice my body was changing. I couldn't help it. The late bloomer started to bloom. I felt scared, confused, worried, embarrassed. I felt stressed. Stress is defined as a state of worry or mental tension caused by a difficult situation. Stress is a natural human response that prompts us to address challenges and threats in our lives. My identity as a runner felt threatened. What if I wasn't the fastest runner? What if I gained weight? The pressure with the weight of college coming up weighed heavily on me. I was so worried about what I would happen if I grew up. I was terrified of who I'd become through puberty. Would I be a good runner who deserves to run in college? I had very high expectations for myself going into college. I always wanted to go to an Ivy League school. I knew I wanted to follow in my mom's footsteps and run in college just like her. I filled my room with positive affirmations. Feel the fear and do it anyway. Believe you can and you will. Always do your best. Relish impossibility. Smile, you are awesome. My room was a place where I could truly dream. Next to the inspirational quotes hung my goals, medals, and race bibs. I went all in on being the best. I couldn't escape the pursuit of perfection. I had all of these positive sayings on my wall, but inside I felt stressed. Senior fall was a really difficult time for me. My body started to change. I didn't like the way I looked. I developed an injury to my ankle over the summer, which inhibited me from running as much as I liked to. Without being able to train in the way that I hoped, I felt like I was disappointing my team and my coach. I mustered through racing that season, but was nowhere as fast as I wanted to be. I felt out of shape. I started to get in my head. I started to question myself and my running abilities. I started to think I wasn't good enough to run in college. Coach Travato put in a good word for me at Boston College, his alma mater, which he talked a lot about. He would always say, BC, best college. He put in a word to Coach Randy Thomas, and Randy invited me to an official visit at Boston College. I gladly accepted it September my senior year. I remember my mom picking me up from the visit, and I couldn't stop talking. I loved the community there. It felt like home. Weeks later, while I was doing my homework in the office, I put my phone to the side. I picked up my phone later to receive a text from Randy Thomas, offering me a scholarship to Boston College. I was blown away. I couldn't believe it. I ran out to the living room and showed my mom the phone. She was so proud of me. The next day, I told Randy Thomas I accepted the offer. Coach Travato was over the moon for me. I was following in his footsteps. He was so excited, I said yes. I no longer had to worry about my future. I was set, soon to be division one runner at Boston College. On the outside, it looked like I had it all together. On the inside, I began to worry. The anxiety I faced my senior fall made me doubt if I was good enough to run at BC. I didn't believe I deserved it because the season did not go as I hoped. I was in my head before every race, telling myself self-defeating thoughts. I became so obsessed with how my body looked and I felt like I was just out of shape. It started to take a really big toll on me. I was not performing well going into the Hockamock League meet. I had won the past two years and I put so much pressure on myself to win three years in a row. I ended up losing the league meet. I felt so embarrassed and ashamed for myself. I felt like I let my team down. I put so much pressure on myself to win the race and I cracked. I couldn't handle the pressure. Leading into the divisional race, coming off my loss at the league championship, it was even worse. My confidence was broken. I was resilient, I was ready to fight back, but things didn't get better mentally or physically. The next week, I had one of the worst races of my life. My legs felt heavy. I felt horrible. I finished the race and remember talking to my dad afterwards on the phone. He had come to watch to support me, and that meant so much to me. He said, 
This is the race I am most proud of you for. I couldn't believe what he said. What does he mean? My dad kept saying, you didn't DNF, did not finish. He was so proud of me for finishing the race. I couldn't understand why he chose this moment on this day to express how proud he was of me. My dad always knew how to pick me up when I fell down. My parents loved and supported me unconditionally, no matter how I raced. Coach Stephen McChesney, the Newton South High School coach, came and spoke at a running camp one time and told us something I will never forget. He always said, no matter how well you race, I'll still feed you. Coach Steve would tell this to all of his athletes and my mom started to pick up on it. She'd always tell me that. It sounds silly, but it's profound. No matter how well you do, I'll still feed you. I used to tell myself things before I would leave for a race, like leave a believer, come back an achiever, but the anxiety still roared. I would tell myself phrases like that, but it didn't stop me from falling from fourth in the state my junior year to 51st my senior year. How embarrassing. I just signed to run with Boston College and I wasn't performing. So what did I do? I tried to regain control in a situation that felt rather out of control. I began tracking and controlling what I ate. I began meticulously counting my meals and cutting out things like dessert. I even learned how to cook so I could make sure that I knew what I was eating. This became my New Year's resolution. I thought, if I just eat healthier, I'll run better. The reason I went to these extreme measures was that I was willing to do whatever it took to preserve my identity as a runner. In fact, all I knew was running. So why wouldn't I do whatever I could to preserve this identity, even if it meant having to cut out some of my favorite things in the world. Senior spring, I began to gain more confidence with these behaviors. I felt in control again. I started to feel better in my skin. Oh, okay, I'm starting to look skinny and strong again. It's my senior year, I can do this. I began performing again, performing well. I bounced back from my difficult indoor and cross country season. I started to feel like that great runner again. I ended up running personal best in the two mile and the 400. I was running fast, but I wasn't fully alive. I became deeply perfectionist. On the outside, I looked like I was happy and I was performing. I won three Hawk titles that year at the outdoor meet. I was running so well and no one questioned how I was doing. I kept a smile on my face. People liked me, senior, captain, going to Boston College. I had it all figured out until I hit the ground with the baton at the Mansfield meet. I was no longer in control. Fast forward to the summer going into my freshman year of college. My behaviors only got worse. My goal was to prove myself. I wanted to prove to coach Randy that he didn't make a mistake in recruiting me. I wanted to show Randy that I was a good runner. I wanted to be on the cross country roster, even though I was recruited for middle distance. I wanted to show him that I could be in the top seven. So I put my head down and got to work. I worked very hard my freshman fall. I was roommates with a girl who had a full scholarship from Belgium with way faster personal best than me. Every part of my life became a competition, constantly trying to do the extra core work in my room, saying no to opportunities to go out and have fun, and pushing the pace on long runs with the upperclassmen. I became addicted to being the best. My freshman year of college, no one would have guessed I was struggling. On the surface, it looked like I was thriving. On the inside, I was dying. I was starving myself. I was starving for approval, for validation, for love. I was starving to feel like I belonged, like I was enough. I put myself through immense hunger and emotional turmoil. On the outside of practice, I cried pretty much every day, calling my mom. I couldn't think straight. I couldn't make decisions for myself. I was afraid to fail. I was afraid not to be perfect. On the cross country course, I felt confident. My confidence was a false sense of confidence. My confidence was rooted in an eating disorder. I was confident in the control I exerted in my life. 
I was confident with my regimented routines and difficult training. I believed I could achieve anything with that. I was running personal best left and right. After running a 447 mile, I felt empty. I didn't feel happy. Sure, I just ran my personal best, but before the race, I was in the bathroom worrying about how I looked. I was so obsessed with my image. I couldn't even take joy in my new personal best. I didn't feel proud of myself. What was this all for? I was trying to please everybody, but I myself wasn't happy. I thought it would get better. Randy gave me an opportunity to run at the U20 six kilometer cross country national championships. I visualized and visualized. I told my family I was gonna win this race. They thought I was crazy, but I didn't. I knew I could do anything I set my mind to. I ended up winning the race, my teammate from Belgium coming in second. We were going to represent Team USA in Denmark at World Cross Country Championships. At Worlds, I got to sit next to some of my favorite people, my idols, Shalane Flanagan, Boston native, New York City Marathon winner. I was at the highest stage of my running career, but I couldn't escape the eating disorder and anxiety. I remember looking at myself in the mirror, thinking that I was fat the day of my race. I stood on the starting line in Denmark with an ambitious goal. I wanted to finish in the top 40 in the world because I had just won the national championship. I better do well because people were watching me. I was ready to go. I was ready to give it 110%. That I did. I started the race out aggressively in the first lap running over sand, mud, water. The second lap was even greater. I moved up. I was feeling good. Then all of a sudden the third lap. My plan was to continue to move up to finish in the top 40, but that didn't go so well. My legs were not feeling great. When I hit the 800 meter mark, all the energy drained from my legs and my body. And I thought to myself, oh no, not again. I felt my legs starting to give out as I was running down the massive hills. Downhill was the worst. I felt like I couldn't control my jello legs. Thought I was gonna fall. I remember everyone passing me and thinking, oh no. I saw my brother Ryan and he tells me he should have seen the look on my face. I was terrified. All I could think was finishing this race for Team USA on my chest. I was so worried I was gonna hit the ground again like I did versus Mansfield. The final straightaway, I mustered all the courage that I had. My legs gave out. I hit the ground steps before the finish line. The announcer said, Oof, a runner went down over the loudspeaker. I crawled over the finish line. I had no energy. I was starving. I was the national champion, starving for approval, for validation. I had this false sense of confidence that I was a badass, but I was truly unhappy, lost, and scared. I really didn't know myself. I was so addicted and obsessed with preserving this image of being the best runner, I lost myself. I was trying to outrun my anxiety and eating disorder, but they ran me into the ground. The endorphins I received from exercise weren't enough to keep me upright. I remember sitting on the plane home from Worlds crying over a bowl of noodles. I was so terrified of eating the carbs. I worried that I was gonna get fat I was crying over a bowl of noodles after just running at the World Cross Country Championships. I was sick and the eating disorder had taken over my life. It was a parasite that latched onto me and my running career. In a time that I was looking for control, the eating disorder came in. I knew something needed to change. A little voice inside of me cried for help. I'd been seeing a doctor and nutritionist throughout my freshman year of college, and they suggested I get help. I remember sitting in the nutritionist's office one day and hearing her say the words, I think you should go to an eating disorder recovery program for athletes. My mouth dropped. Me? Eating disorder? I don't have an eating disorder. Well, she was right. Treatment was the best thing for me. I decided to go. My mom and dad supported me 100%. 
Going to treatment was one of the most scariest, difficult things I ever had to do in my life. I had to put aside running in order to get better because I was not well, mentally or physically. I was unhappy. I began going to Walden Behavioral Care to receive treatment, starting three nights a week, and then they moved me up to five days a week. I began going to what I call eating disorder school. I would learn about myself and my mind for eight hours a day, relearning how to take care of myself and eat. At Walden, I learned to face my greatest fears, had to overcome the fear of gaining weight. Over-exercising and under-eating for over a year, I developed osteoporosis in my back as an 18-year-old. I approached recovery in the same way I did training. I was, over, I was determined to overcome this beast that had taken over. That summer was the hardest summer of my life. I would call my dad every day after treatment because I knew that he could understand, having gone through treatment himself. When I wasn't talking to my dad on the phone, I began recording voice memos, talking about my experience and how I was feeling. I began to learn how to focus on my feelings and my emotions. No longer was I running away from how I felt. That summer, I learned how to put my mental health first, began to realize that I needed help and I couldn't do that alone. And that was okay. One day, my dad suggested I pray to God. That invitation truly changed my life. I made a desperate prayer to God, to ask God to let me hear your voice through someone else because I had never heard the voice of God. I didn't know who God was, but my dad told me to do it and I loved and believed in my dad, so I did. I asked God if I should stay in this program for one more week or go back to school for preseason. The woman next to me said, you need to get the F out of here. She said, you're ready, set your, set your wings and fly. So I took her word and I left. I went back to school for my sophomore year. The time I spent away was quickly met with pressure and expectations, not only from myself, but from my coach. Randy believed in me. He wanted me to be on the roster of NCAAs. When I returned, he pushed me. He gave me difficult workouts. I was afraid, but over the summer, I learned how to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Mentally, I was ready to rise to the challenge, but I didn't know how to slow down. I wanted to get back to running full speed. I wanted it so badly. I wanted to be the runner I used to be before treatment. I wanted more than anything to be successful again. I wanted to reclaim my identity as a runner. I was willing to do whatever it took. I pushed myself extremely hard in workouts. A slight pain in my leg turned into a full on limp. I will never forget walking down the stairs in my dorm, feeling my leg give out on me. That was weird, I thought. I showed up for the next workout around the reservoir at Boston College and completed the whole thing. Had to prove myself. After the workout, I could barely walk. Why? I had to show coach that I was still worthy and that I could make nationals. In reality, I wasn't ready. My mind and my body were not on the same page. My mind wanted something that my body wasn't ready for. I put my body through a lot of stress with the eating disorder and I was still healing. I wanted to be healed, but I wasn't. I ended up sustaining a grade three stress fracture in my tibia. I was out of running for four months. I was on crutches for a month and a walking boot for two months. Without running, I didn't know who I was. While I was scared of taking a break from running, deep down, something inside of me thought, this could be good. I can actually heal. Sophomore spring, we got sent home for COVID. I was devastated. I just began running again, and now I had to go back home and train all alone. I hated running in a bigger body. I started to question myself. Who was I? What was, what was my purpose? My faith and my family kept me going. Weekly therapy helped me process these difficult emotions. As I always did, I kept moving. The race wasn't over. I wasn't going to DNF. I knew there would be light. I continued to run towards the light, even on the darkest days. My mom always tells me, it's always darkest before the dawn. 
Going into my junior year, my body was still not cooperating. The last race I had run was World Cross Country Championships. It had been two years since I raced. A week before my first race back, my junior spring, post injuries and treatment, I sustained yet another stress fracture. I was devastated. I had the option to race and potentially make it worse or start the healing process. I decided to start the healing process, but that meant having to accept that I will not compete my junior year. That meant sophomore and junior year I was out. Going into my senior year, I was determined to get back on track. I didn't want to get knocked down by injuries or my mind. I wanted to be back. I wanted to stand up. I found myself injured going into the fall of my senior year with my third stress fracture. I tried to come back too quickly. I knew that if I wanted to step on the track again, I needed to be very serious about taking care of my mind and my body. It was extremely scary to learn how to trust myself again. I remember my sports psychologist telling me, in order to trust yourself, you need to put yourself in risky situations and prove that you can do it. My first race back was January 2022, nearly three years since I last raced, March 2019. I felt proud, happy, relieved. I didn't quit. My legs and my mind forgot how it felt to race, but my heart didn't. This time, I crossed the finish line strongly on two feet. The time I ran equaled my freshman year of high school. But this race was different. It was the start of a new chapter. I began my final senior spring season with God. I did whatever it took to stay healthy and race. I spent two to three hours a day working with my physical therapist, getting the treatment I needed to stay healthy enough to race. Mentally, I leaned on prayer, family, and friends. My body was still in shambles, having to relearn how to run again. I competed through some minor aches and pains but with the courage and heart, knowing no matter how well I did, I was proud of myself. I ran my senior spring at Boston College as a celebration. I called every race my victory lap. I didn't run the fastest times in the world, but I ran with joy and that's what mattered. I learned that love is the most important thing in life, not the time I run on the track. Running is not the most important thing in the world, but love is. I have come to see myself not as a runner, but as beloved. I have come to see myself as a woman capable of many things. I finished the race of college, and now I begin the race of life. I have come to think of life not as a race to be won, but rather a path to be explored. Hanging up my competitive spikes and crossing the line of my last college race, I felt relieved. My job as a runner was up. Now it was time to be Nicole. Prayer, journaling, faith, family, friends, teammates. This is what brought me back to the starting line. I couldn't get through the darkness alone. The light of their love was my guide. Love brought me back to the starting line and love continues to propel me beyond the track. Each day, I continue to learn more about myself I'm finding myself outside of athletics. I'm coming to define myself in terms of love. We all have a place in this world. We are here for a reason. Our identity is not what we do. We are not defined by our successes or our shortcomings. We are all too busy running the race of life. Let's slow down. Where are you heading? Are you focused on the finish line, the outcome, the promotion, the grade, the personal best, the accomplishment? Or are you focused on the track, the journey, the people, the love? Remember, we are human beings, not human doings. Thank you.
Wow. Thank you, Nicole. That was beautiful. Words for us to really um, reflect on and live by. Thank you. Appreciate it. So we are fortunate tonight to have a panel of um, students and staff members as well as community members um, to answer some questions. Um, and tell us a little bit about our students are going to begin by telling us a little bit about their experiences and what they're hearing with their peers and then our um, community members are going to and staff members are going to share with us um, some resources and what they're hearing as well. All right. So I'll introduce, I don't know, if, I'll have you guys introduce yourselves. It saves me a trying to pronounce names. So uh, we can start with Dr. Cohen if you want to start. So if you could just tell our audience um, your name and your role. Hi, I'm Dr. Wendy Cohen. I'm a family medicine physician, um, also on the board of the Safe Coalition, and a parent of a um, 14 and 10 year old boys in Foxborough. Hi, I'm Sarah Mavardi. I'm a Franklin resident, community advocate, and a parent of a 14-year-old at FHS and an 11-year-old. Hi, I'm Risa Hawkins. I am a member of this committee, um, as well as a community member and a parent of an 18-year-old who is a senior here um, and a recent um, FHS graduate. I am also a clinical psychologist and a professor at Boston University of Psychiatry. Hi, I'm Audrey Hawkins. I'm her daughter and a senior at FHS, and I'm also on this board. Hi, I'm Arsh Tiagi, and I'm a freshman at this school. Hi, I'm Lily Itzmo. I'm a senior at Franklin High School. My name is Vinny Pascros. I'm a sophomore at Franklin High School. Hi, I'm Ann Davies. I'm an adjustment counselor at Franklin High School, and I'm a member of the Mental Health Task Force. Hi, I'm Leanne Soulard. I'm a guidance counselor here at the high school. Hello, <clears throat> excuse me. I am Brittany Crosby. I am a 2011 Franklin High School graduate. I am a Franklin resident, and I am also the district social worker. All right. Thank you all. All right, so we'll start with um, the students, because I think that's really our focus for tonight, is really to hear from our student voices. Um, so I'll start with Audrea. What are you experiencing or hearing from your um, peers regarding stress? So especially as a senior this year, I'm hearing a lot about college. There's so much stress around what everyone's plans are for next year, and I'm sure Lily can relate to this too. Uh, it's something that people don't always want to talk about because everyone experiences something different. Not everyone's going to a school that they're super proud about, or they might feel ashamed of maybe making a choice that wasn't to go to college or to do something different. And the many different paths that people take causes a lot of stress. And the people who are putting a lot of pressure on themselves too, to maybe go to the best school and doing so much work and maybe not even paying off for them in the end. The stress was so immense, especially this fall season with college applications, and I think it took a major toll on the senior class. For sure, it's a big one. Thank you. Arsh, I'll give you the next question. Um, um, as a freshman, what I see being a big stress factor is just trying to fit in. Um, we all just came from eighth grade, and the class, the grade size um, almost quadrupled, and it's natural to want to fill it in, to conform. Um, so that's a very big stressor in my life. Uh, depending on what group you're with, um, grades can also be a very big stressor. Um, just a little while ago, the fact that everything I'm doing right now, every quiz is going to contribute to a grade that's going to matter for my future. So it's like the pressure of life actually happening is starting. All right, Lily, I'm going to give you a different question. We know the pandemic changed things for many people. How has it affected you or your peers regarding mental health? Um, I think that the pandemic um, forced a lot of people to think about their mental health um, in a more like personal way, um, being separate and away from all your friends. Um, I think de definitely forced me to, um, you know, internalize and kind of like not necessarily um, feel like help was always um, around and available to me. Um, so that allowed, I think, for me, especially during the pandemic, um, and for my friends I know as well, to develop um, certain 
internalizations of different like um, negative parts of mental mental health, but also um, I definitely found some outlets during the pandemic, like photography and that sort of thing that I know other people um, have found, like things like sports um, that definitely have helped them and continue to help them as uh, we move from the pandemic. So, Vinny, from your perspective, how has the pandemic changed maybe your mental health? Um, for me, the pandemic started when I was in middle school and um, we really got our first year back my freshman year in high school. Um, so going from middle school to freshman year, there was obviously more people, bigger school, um, and the workload was a lot harder than middle school. So being able to balance um, a life outside of school and a life in school um, on top of playing sports and doing ec extracurricular activities was definitely more challenging in making the transition to high school, which caused more stress for all the students um, in my class. Um, a lot of people had a hard time fitting in and figuring out where they belonged. So the pandemic in that way changed a lot of people's um, personalities, like narratives, what they thought of themselves and what they thought of others. Um, and obviously now being a sophomore, it's still a lot of figuring out and learning and growing um, throughout the year. So stress has played a huge part in being able to figure out who you are and where you belong. Great, thank you. Go back down, Lily. How um, does the pressure from the adults in your life, whether it's your parents, your family members, your teachers, administrators, community members, impact your choice of activities or your enjoyment of your extracurricular activities? Um, so for this one, I think that um, a lot of a lot of my friends specifically have a lot of pressure, um, especially in their senior year, you know, what goes on your college transcript and what doesn't. Um, I think that there is a lot of pressure, especially as like during the college application process, um, to say that you have a bunch of leadership positions versus, um, you know, just being a member in the club. And I think that that pressure um, and, and kind of trying to build the best resume is something that is definitely, um, you know, involved like as a freshman and as a sophomore and as an underclassman, but definitely as a senior um, and as a junior, I know that um, extracurriculars and, you know, trying to look good for a college um, is something that's, it's really stressful. And um, I know a lot of people feel stressed about that one, so. Arsh, do you want to take um, that question? Sure. So my brother is a senior right now, so he just committed to college actually. And um, so he went through uh, everything Lily was just talking about. He did a lot of stuff throughout his high school career, joined a lot of extracurriculars and joined a good college. Um, and now that he committed, my parents like turned their focus to me. So they want me to, <laughs> they want me to follow in his footsteps. They want me to, um, you know, get good grades join um, extracurriculars, get leadership positions, build up a resume for college. And um, I think that that has led me to do a lot of extracurriculars. And a lot of the time, um, I'm just kind of there. Like I'm not, there's no passion in it. And when there's no passion, there is no real um, effort being done. There's no real, um, I can't think of the word. But so I'm also an avid swimmer. And swimming is something that I've wanted to quit for a long time. But um, my parents ha have always pushed me to uh, keep doing it, keep doing it. And a part of me is like, yeah, I want to do this. It's good exercise. It's a sport I sort of enjoy. But another part of me just wishes that, that I could take a step back from it a bit. And if I wasn't pressured so much into doing it, then maybe I could find my own footing, explore other activities, or really enjoy the sport. Okay, I know as a parent, I'm feeling guilty right now. I don't know about you all. <laughs> yep, sorry, Rock. <laughs> all right, um, but again, no judgment, no guilt, no blame here, okay? We're, all, it's a, we're, we're safe, it's a safe space. Adria, what, um, what driving force um, is the driving force when you or your peers are engaging in unhealthy or disruptive behaviors? What do you think the driving force is? Yeah, I think unhealthy and disruptive behaviors can often be uh, due to stress and 
levels of anxiety and depression people don't know how to cope with and doing things that they would regret in the future just wouldn't want to be doing because that is how they're coping in the moment i've heard students say i'm going to start vaping because my friend said it helps her relieve stress to vape or i'm going to be high every day because i don't want to face school or i don't want to face the pressure of this and it's also for many students too a way to rebel in a different way against maybe not harming themselves, but it is a form of self-harm. And I think students turn to things, disruptive behaviors, because they don't know what else to go to. And other, they see other students doing it, and it's not a great example. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, someone else want to? You'll do that one too? OK, Vinny. Um, so for me, um, this year, I was able to be part of the hockey team, which is probably one of my proudest accomplishments in life. Just being a little kid, going to the games, growing up, always wanted to be on the hockey team. So being able to do it sophomore year was really fun. Um, playing with a lot of upperclassmen, I always just wanted to, them to like me and, them to, and me to fit in with them and be able to go out with them and have a good time with them. And so I finally was, um, towards the middle of the season, was able to go out and have a good time. and. Um, a thing that I saw a lot there was peer pressure, um, which is, and a lot of people falling for it due to stress. And um, being an athlete, I know better than not to put that stuff in my body. So um, just seeing it affect people that, you know, I cared about and people that I was sharing the ice with every day and in the locker room with every day was challenging. And I remember actually asking the guy next to me, I go, why? I go, why are you? Why are you smoking? He goes, man, it just helps me relieve stress. And I was thinking to myself, I go, this person really needs help and support from other people. So I made sure that as the year went on, I was able to be there for him and make sure that if he ever needed anything or needed to relieve stress, I was there and someone to talk to. Excellent. Thank you, Vinny. Lily, what don't you want adults to know when they ask you how you are? So if I came up to you and say, how are you doing, Lily? And you'd just say, fine. What do you really want to tell me? Or what don't you want to tell me? Um, I think that a lot of the times, especially as a teenager, um, the adults in my life all hold kind of a specific role, um, whether it's my mom or whether it's Ms. Verano or whether it's you know a principal or, or whoever I'm speaking to. Um, there is a certain interaction that I'm supposed to have with that um, adult, especially like when it's a coach, for example. Um, I definitely want to make sure that I'm performing in the way that I need to be um, in a classroom or in, in a sports example. Um, so I think that it's really hard as a teenager to be honest with the adults in my life just because I know that that pressure exists and is there. Um, and so, yeah, so if Ms. Marana were to ask me how I'm doing, um, I would probably say I'm fine just because I don't want to make anyone feel like I'm letting them down. And I think that's a pressure that a lot of teenagers face at this age too, is that you want to say that you're good all the time because it's a lot easier to. And you know, I think that's something that a lot of like humans and adults face too. Um, but yeah, I mean like, what am I holding back? I feel like a lot of the time it's like stuff I probably would only tell my friends or like people that are, you know, as close to me as I, as I think they are, so yeah. Um, also, sometimes um, I just don't want to get into it. So, like, um, there will be sometimes my parents ask me, ask me, um, like, how I'm doing, and I'm. It's like we're in the car. It's five minutes until we reach our destination. Like, not the best time, mom. But, <laughs> um, and then other times it's purely that I don't know if they're going to understand. I don't know if they're going to approve of me. Uh, I know, like speaking from a personal standpoint, my parents are both immigrants from India and um, they talk a lot about the struggle they had when they came here. They told me that when they came here, they came with only two suitcases. Um, they brought a cooking pan because they didn't know like what's in America, which was really random, but um, and so they talked to me about all the struggle, about how they didn't really have money and how they like strived and strained and they made it. And it makes my high school drama or whatever my stresses are seem kind of irrelevant. Um, so I think that also just setting certain boundaries with um, whoever you're talking to is very important. 
um, and how you present yourself, you need to present yourself as someone you can look up to, but also um, as someone who is still vulnerable and um, someone you can still empathize with. I just wanted to add something. Um, so actually in English right now, we're learning, we're reading Macbeth and um, analyzing the play. And we read a poem on one day and it's called We Wear the Mask. And it's about hiding your true feelings inside from who you are on the outside. And so I thought that that would relate uh, nicely to this. And just sitting there listening to everyone talking about um, like how um, Lady Macbeth, for example, has a lot of ambition and power on the outside, but during her time period, um, women in the kingdom didn't have a role. And so I did a lot of thinking about what I was hiding from everyone else and what I was hiding. And I usually go home, my mom asked me, how was school today, how was sports? I'm like, it was great, it was great, but in reality, I'm most of the time drained, tired, it's not going good. And I feel like just being able to have someone to talk to about how you feel about these things really makes a difference. So I would say find that person. And going through life, I've been able to have my mom to, and my dad to talk to, which I'm very grateful for. Great. Thank you. Audrey, do you yeah. want to? I, I also just wanted to add, too, I think something students fear, or just my peers in general, is the reaction they're going to get from their parents. I know one thing for me, too, is I'm afraid to tell my mom or anyone <laughs> something that I'm going through just because I'm worried that she'll feel sad and I know oh she has a, a lot on her plate right now too and I don't want her to feel sad for me I don't want to see my mom upset I don't want to see my parents feel sad or bad that I had to go through this and I think a, a, another thing a lot of students fear too is if I tell my mom this I'm she's gonna make me go get help or she's gonna send me to a facility and I think students fear so much that they're gonna get this attention that is scary to them, but it's so helpful in the long run that some people maybe need this help or that their parents are gonna react too big at first. So I think it's important to take small steps and I think also it's important for parents to, when they ask how their child is doing, ask what their child needs and who else they can talk to and where they can go, and what makes them feel better, what they can do what, what coping strategies they have and how they deal with it instead of just making a solution and giving them, giving, telling them how they're gonna deal with it right away. Great. Lily, can you um, answer the question of what, how can the adults in your life help you, your parents? Because you shared a... a um, yeah, so I think there's a couple of adults that have really done a fantastic job in, in helping me, me with my mental health and how I deal with things. Um, one of them is an adjustment counselor here at Franklin High School. Um, his name is Mr. Schneeweiss. Um, I think that for a lot of my childhood and for like my teenage years, I didn't really feel like I had the easiest place at home to really speak about um, the things that I was facing, um, whether that was like problems with anxiety or depression. Um, I didn't really feel like I had that spot. Um, and so the reason actually why I ended up even seeing Mr. Schneeweiss is I was crying in class. And they, um, someone had directed me to the third floor house office, which was where he was at that time. Um, and really just being able to have that, um, that person there that um, I know was continuously rooting for me um, and able to listen to me and able to relate to me in so many different ways. Um, I think that, you know, listening and active listening is something that so many of us struggle with, um, whether that's in regards to mental health or, or anything else. Um, I think that mental health is, it's different for everyone and that's what makes it so difficult, um, is that it's easy for, you know, it's easy to not relate to someone, but in the same way, um, I think that listening um, and really sitting down and maybe not asking like, why did you feel this way? But like more like, how did you feel this way? Um, like what made you feel this way and identifying identifying behaviors um, Making sure that you recognize the situations that make you feel the way you do and then um, adjusting them for next time um, so definitely like I met mr. Schneeweiss in my in the middle of my junior year um, and I think that really um, Being able to talk to someone and know that somebody is listening to me um, Made me feel valued and important and heard um, and that's something that um, you know, I, I still like 
to this day, I've been able to work on that relationship with both my parents to have more of a, a valued connection. Um, and that's, that's something that's really important, and I know that a lot of parents work hard to have that open communication with people, um, but it's difficult. Um, and so definitely making sure to encourage collaboration, encourage conversation, um, and yeah, I don't know. I think that just starting a conversation with it about, um, about mental health is often the, a, a right step in the Oh, a step in the right direction. <laughs> Anyone else want to? Sure. Um, so for me in my freshman year, um, I struggled a lot with fitting in and finding the right people. And at the end of last year, I was struggling the most. And I didn't know who to go to for help or who to ask for help. And I didn't want to ask my parents um, if they could get me help. So I remember I went into um, the guidance offices and met with um, Mrs. Briggs in one of her rooms and we actually met a few times after that so just having that person there to help me you know and someone to talk to about what I was going through at the time um, just made the days seem easier and you know obviously made the summer a lot better and coming back and just finding the right people I know my math teacher from last year um, Miss Curtis is like one of my favorite people at school and someone I can talk to about anything. And same with Officer Garino. Um, my parents know him very well. And so just having someone there to help me and to talk to me was a big thing for me. No, that's OK, sure. <laughs> I also just think it's really important to, um, to be vulnerable with your kids, too, because I think we all, especially when you're younger, you look up to your parents a lot, and you, they seem very perfect, and you're like, oh, my mom, she's the most perfect person ever. Um, <laughs> and But, like, you really do admire your parents, and you don't think that they're going to understand or relate to what you're going through because they seem like they've got it all figured out and put together. So I think if everyone's vulnerable, vulnerable and tells you know how they're feeling too that that can really make a change in your household in your community and at school too sometimes I think it's scary to go like I don't want to cry at school I don't want to show emotion at school I don't want to go to guidance and cry to them about how I'm feeling but like that is what it's there for and I think more vulnerable people and people opening up about what they're going through it helps a lot so yeah Arsh anything you want to share yeah just to um add on to the adjustment counselors. I've also seen the adjustment counselor here a couple times. And at my old school, I used to have weekly meetings with them. Um, and that really helped. Uh, also going to the vulnerability thing, I think that um, sometimes you, uh, you're so great yourself that your kids want to live up to that greatness. Like my dad, um, he was number one and number two in his class every single year. And he got per these perfect grades. He got into a very good college. Hyper, like in these very competitive scenarios, he still came out number one uh, to the point where he was able to come to this country. And I think that just being here with all these opportunities, I'm like, wow, I have it so much easier. So I should be able to outperform him. But something that he told me is like, hey, dude, it doesn't matter what grades you get. Um, it's OK. Like, if, if getting a B or a C is the best you can do, then that is okay. Um, he, he told me he doesn't care what the grade is. He told me he cares that I understand why I got the grade and I improve, and he cares that I improve on that. So I think just building that environment um, and keeping that a consistent behavior towards your children is very beneficial. Sorry, I just wanna add more thing. Um, I think. I think that um, acceptance is something that's really, really important, um, and that kind of goes to your point. I feel like um, so many, so many parents have really high expectations for their children, and that is awesome and, and encourages discipline in so many different ways. But I also do think that acceptance and you know really putting your child first and and listening and understanding and wanting to understand, right? Um, I think that that is important, and that effort, um, regardless of how effective it is, I think that effort is one of the biggest things that comes with mental health, is if you are actively listening to your child and you definitely, you know, are, are putting in the work and you're, and you're communicating in, in beneficial ways, um, I think it does work out in the long run, but it is a long and important process to, to go through, especially if you're struggling with it with your child, as is. 
Is there anything else, students, that you want us adults to know regarding mental health and stressors of our students and children? Um, so I'll go back to my example from earlier. Um, so I'm a sophomore, and this was my first year on the hockey team. And like I said, it was the best experience of my life. And as the year went on, um, like Nicole, I found myself wanting to be perfect all the time. Um, and it came to a point late in the season and in the playoffs where I was able to get my first starts on varsity. And as everyone was saying their names, it was senior, senior, senior captain, junior. And then they got to me, and I was a sophomore. And I felt like I needed to prove something to them. And I needed to show everyone that I could play with everyone and I could be the difference. But in reality, I just kept thinking too much. I let my emotions take over the game, and I ended up not playing a good game. And then after the game, realizing and replaying the game negatively in my head and how bad I played that game. So just having people in your life to talk to really helps. So my biggest thing is find somebody that you're comfortable talking to with and just be able to talk to them about anything. And it made my whole sophomore year a lot better, freshman year obviously a lot better, and being able to just express my emotions without um, criticism or judgment made me feel really good about myself. And I think another um, big stressor that we want adults to realize too is balancing things is one of the hardest. So balancing your extracurriculars with your schoolwork and sports and everything you do after school can become so stressful and you wanna do well in all of them that you feel like you're not living up to your expectations or performing as well as people would expect you to in any of them, right? You're going to school and your grades aren't doing as well and you feel like your teachers are disappointed in you because you were out late at soccer practice last night or whatever it was and then you had your national honor society club meeting and you had to go to a dog sport and you had all these things going on after school or maybe you had to babysit a sibling or go to work to help your family or do whatever it is that you have to do and balancing all of it you feel like you're starting to not do anything good enough and i think that's a huge 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 thing for all my peers and i think too with especially with college applications as well, they expect you to be a well-rounded student, meaning you have a little bit of everything going for you. And if you have a little bit of everything, you feel like you might not be doing well enough at some things. And I think it's important to, to check in with your kids and every once in a while too, to be like, so are you still enjoying soccer? Is that something you wanna be doing? Like you were saying about swimming and all of that. Like, are you still enjoying doing that? Because I think we try so hard to keep up with things and you know have it on your transcript that I was on the track team all four years when maybe that's not something that's working for you anymore. And I think it's really important to check in with your kids too, to see if they, not saying that like people enjoy their sports, not saying you should quit them or stop doing them because you're so stressed, but just making a plan to, to prioritize what's most important to you and to cut out things that maybe you're not enjoying as much and to make sure that your kid isn't doing it just to please you or a coach or a teacher or whoever it may be. Great. Thank you all. Amazing, aren't they? I learned so much from them. All right. So now we'll hear from our adult panel. So Dr. Cohen, what, um, we have a lot of data, as we shared earlier, that's showing our students are feeling this stress, and you've heard it just from our student panel tonight, and increased mental health challenges. So what are you seeing in your practice um, in regarding to families and students that might be coming in. Yeah, I'm, is this on? I'm definitely seeing more um, depression, more anxiety. Um, remarkably younger kids um, than, ten, than I saw 10 years ago with significant depression and anxiety issues. Um, a lot of what the students said really resonated with things I, I see. There's often a, a disconnect where the parent thinks that they're clear on their expectations and acceptance, and then there's, but there's things that they're saying and doing in their day-to-day -day routine that the kid interprets as not enough or not acceptance, and I, I liked what 
Adria said about talk, just almost narrating what a time for you that's that's been hard and maybe you didn't handle it well, maybe you could have handled it better. Like, I, I think the, the disconnect sometimes between the parents thinking that their, their kids are acting out on purpose or out of defiance is almost never the case in my experience. It's usually they're suffering and they don't know what to do with it. And, and part of my job is to help bring the parent and the kid together and, and talk, but the more you as a parent can proactively ask those open-ended questions, let your kid know that there's no situation that they can't come to you about that whatever even if they or you are disappointed in their choice or their behavior it doesn't change the way you feel about them and you're you're always there to work through things with them can you share with our, our community members and parents the signs that they should be looking for for anxiety and depression like how do they know the difference between my child's distressed and nervous about a test or nervous about the game compared to oh my goodness i think i need to get my child some help yeah um i mean the first thing is ask them mm -hmm. if if they're willing and if you can ask it in a way that they feel comfortable sharing but kind of the the red flags that i look for are persistence, um, uh, more uh, not just one day of, of feeling down, but a more persistent pattern, withdrawing from social uh, interactions or activities that they usually enjoy, um, not being able to enjoy things that they previously did, um, prolonged trouble sleeping, um, also, if you, like wearing weather incongruent clothing can sometimes be a sign that they're hiding um, self injury, mm -hmm. um, and keep keep asking. Just let the kid know that it's a that it's not necessarily going to be a huge big deal. That it, you you're there to talk and that you can manage your own reactions and they are not responsible for your reactions or response. Okay. Lisa, do you have any? Uh, yeah, I think that was a great list. Um, I think the other, just in addition to all of those things, like one of the other signs, I think that things, you know, maybe more than just typical stress um, is a drastic change in eating behavior too, right? Whether that is, um, you know, an eating disorder or sometimes just signs of depression um, as well. So, um, loss, you know, loss of appetite, not eating at all, um, or really binging and overeating um, in a way that's atypical for your child is sometimes another real um, identifiable sign that um, you might not realize is a sign of something else. Um, I also think just like dramatic changes in their social activities. So, you know, kids who, typically would go out on the weekends or see friends a lot who are just staying home a lot more is a pretty big red flag, especially for teenagers, or sometimes in reverse. Um, so, you know, a kid who now is out all the time and you never see them at all anymore, sometimes that's sort of normal um, for, for this age group, but when it's, you know, at a point where it feels like they can't kind of be alone with themselves at all, that they're kind of have this frenzy of looking to do something and stay busy and stay out all the time can sometimes also be another sign that, um, that things aren't going well in a more serious way. Um, and then I think just is it impairing their ability to function is the biggest thing, right? Like we all, we all get sad, we all get anxious, we all get stressed, um, but are they not really able to do the things that really are their role in life, right? Are they not able to go to school? Um, are they not able to, you know, do what, engage in whatever they were engaging in around the house anymore or in their extracurriculars? Is it just become too much for them? Great. And I know you shared, you and Audrey had shared the story of when the kids quitting, I mean, you, you just, you figured out that swimming just wasn't their thing anymore. Can you share, Risa, as the parent, that story of like how you figured that out and finally said, oh my gosh, I think, I think this is 
not going well. Yeah, we we're, were Audrey and I were kind of um, snickering a little. Um, Arsh, because we could we could relate very much. So, so um, Audrey and her sister both swam earlier than high school. Um, they're, um, they come from a long swimming family, not on my short side of the family, but um, on their dad's. Um, and there's Olympic swimmers, m multiple Olympic swimmers on his side of the family. And so there was this you know, feeling of like, well, this should be your sport. This is going to be a thing you're going to be really good at. Um, and so Gotham went to swimming pretty early. And um, I hated it so much. <laughs> it was like <laughs> the worst sport for, I think, parents to watch, right? Like, it's just not fun to watch, right? like, you know. It, you're hot, it's like the middle of, um, you know, the middle of the winter and you're in your winter coat and you're like at this that sweaty pool and it's like, it's super uncomfortable and you can't tell which kid's yours because you just see like their little cap and they're all wearing the same cap and they go by for like a second and like, it's just not that much fun. Um, <laughs> I didn't find it fun. Um, but we were like, oh, this is what the kids are really into, so we're going to do it. And it's early mornings at the pool. And finally, after um, one year, both the girls came to me and said, like, so, you know, I was like, it's time to sign up again for a swim for next season. Um, I just need this information about, like, you know, your swimsuit size. I'm like, do we have to do it this year? And it was the first time I ever realized that they didn't actually like it. Like, I was super relieved. <laughs> I think they, they were doing it because they thought I, we wanted them to, and we were doing it because we thought they had fallen in love with this thing and needed us to, but in reality, we all hated it. They hated it so bad. <laughs> I was miserable swimming. Yeah, and gymnastics too. <laughs> there you go. Okay. All right, we'll move on now. Uh, <laughs> Leanne Soulard, can you, regarding college and career, what are you hearing from parents and then what are you hearing from the students about, and especially about like managing those expectations? You know, we, we're, we're Franklin, Franklin High, you know, we have college path and, and so what else is there or what are you hearing? Well, I think we've heard from the students about how it's going and what they're experiencing. Um, you know, it makes me a little sad to hear that. I know it's happening. We all know what's happening. Um, you know, I think living in the greater Boston area is a blessing and a curse because we have so many prestigious institutions around us and without even trying, um, the adults in our lives, and this has been, you know, probably for hundreds of years since these institutions have been around, hold them up as a touchstone, right? Like, this is what a good college is. And when people ask me that question, well, what's, what's a good college? I say, I don't know. Like, what, what is a good college? You know, it is all about perspective. Um, I think one thing that we can do pretty immediately to take the stress level down quite a bit um, would be to focus on finding the right fit college over prestige. Prestige does not mean that you're getting a superior education. Hard stop, right? Colleges, good colleges, have been fined many times for gaming the rankings. It's easy to game the rankings. A lot of colleges are pulling out now because it's actually doing them a disservice. Um, I think we could all probably agree that, you know, being named a Fulbright Scholar is quite a prestigious accomplishment. And top Fulbright producing scholarship, um, or institutions rather, are colleges that you may never have even heard of. Denison University, Kenyon College, Union College, one of my personal favorites. I don't have any ties to it, but I think it's a great place. University of Puget Sound. Who's heard of that? A top Fulbright producing institutions. So I think we need to really get away from prestige. And one thing that I'll say, um, because I've been doing this a long time and I feel comfortable saying this now as a message for parents, if, if you are pressuring your student to get into a good college, whatever that is, I think it's really a sign for you to take a step back and think about, is that your goal or is that your child's goal? Because I, I think that it's a really subtle message that gets imprinted early and students carry that with them. So one of the hardest things that I do every fall is with seniors go over their college lists and I'm like the typical, 
dream crushing guidance counselor that's like on all the TV shows that we all remember from her because I look at the list and I'm like every single college here has an acceptance rate of less than 10%. That's not going to work. That's a recipe for heartbreak. I go through way too many tissues in the spring, you know, nursing broken hearts and hurt feelings. Um, but that message gets impl like imprinted really, really early. So, you know, it's a lot for students to carry with them. We have to, we have to kind of revisit the language that we're using about that. So um, another thing that I'll say, and this is just sort of a selfish plug for the guidance department, but, you know, I've not always worked in the school district. And I have to say that this guidance department, I mean, there's over 100 combined years of college advising experience in that office. And um, unfortunately, people aren't using it really early, you know? And I think if they did, and, and maybe we need to get out there and, and spread the word a little bit more, but there's a lot of knowledge in that office. And um, we want to, we're begging for you to come down to help alleviate the burden. You know, we, we don't want you running the high school rat race with the activities. And um, somebody, I don't remember who said it a few minutes ago, said like, drop the things that aren't bringing you joy. Yeah, problem solved. Like nobody, colleges aren't looking for perfection. Like they want to know what makes you tick as a person. And chances are, if, it's, it, if it doesn't add anything to your life, it's not adding anything to your college application. So feel free to drop that. And if you've got questions, go and see your guidance counselor, because we definitely want to talk to you about that. Thank you. Anne, this question's for you. How do you know that a student's stress level is where you want, where, where we want to make sure we seek out resources or intervene at the schools from a sure. school perspective? From a school perspective, and before I get into the, the warning signs or stressors that I know have already been touched upon, um, I want to highlight uh, something that struck me with the students, talking about the connections and having somebody that they feel connected to. Um, and. In Franklin, at the schools, that's something that we as a staff strive really hard to do is make a connection with each student. We want each student to have at least one person that they feel connected to at school so that they not only feel like they can advocate to that person and reach out to them, but also so that that staff member might pick up on these warning signs should they come up. So some things that we notice, a lot of it will be overlapping at home or in a doctor's office, but a change in affect. So a student who normally comes in with a smile on their face, very bubbly, who suddenly looks down and um, isn't as expressive anymore. Um, a change in motivation or not caring about things that they used to, or a change in academic performance would be a red flag or a sign that maybe something's going on. Lack of focus, distractibility. Um, irritability or a change in behavior. Uh, so sometimes more externalizing behaviors or more outward presentation of behaviors. Sometimes that might mean social withdrawal or isolating. Um, a change in appearance or a decline in hygiene would also be another factor that we'd look out for. And I think it's also important to note that it's every student is going to present differently. And um, in adolescence, every student is going to have times that they struggle. So we wouldn't look at this for one day. If we're noticing a pattern with this, if they're coming in over a period of time with this, um, that's when we would really be concerned. Um, and a lot of times we have students reach out to us on their own and self-refer. A lot of times teachers will speak up and come to us with concerns about a student, like I know Lily was talking about that in her experience. Um, and then other times we have concerned friends that might reach out about their, about their peers as well. And we would also encourage parents to reach out and to call um, their, their student's adjustment counselor and th the office is very helpful in, in figuring out who that is if you're not sure, but we wanna help. Um, and if you do hear from the adjustment counselor, please know that it's not um, from a place of judgment or trying to get anybody in trouble. It's because we want to collaborate and help um, and work together to get the student support. Great. Brittany, we're hearing a lot from our families um, that there's no counselors available, outside resources. What are some other alternatives? What, what do you, what can a parent do when, okay, we're seeing signs, something's not right with my child, what can I do? I think it's been a common theme all night tonight is that it takes a village. Um, and so one of the things that I've realized in my experiences, especially this year, um, out 
outpatient wait lists for therapy services, groups, anything can be up to several months to a year to get the help that you need um, for anxiety and depression and um, any mental health or substance use needs. Um, I think, again, it takes a village. So the more eyes on, the more hands on a student that feels supported and feels, a lot of our students on the panel said, feeling heard, having someone that they can talk to. Um, that could be a guidance counselor, that could be a school adjustment counselor, that could be a teacher, a parent, a friend, a neighbor. Um, it could be anyone. Um, so that in the interim for those services to, to begin that they have someone that they can talk to and they can process. Obviously, if it is a mental health emergency or a crisis situation, um, that's a little different. Those, those services are immediate. But um, if it's something as far as a student waiting on a wait list for a provider, um, I think it takes a village. Risa, do you have anything to add? Yeah, we're, we're in a horrible crisis right now um, where the demand for services is outstripping supply in a really dramatic way. Um, but a couple of things is one, I would like, don't be discouraged so much by when we hear what the wait list is that you don't even bother to put your name on it. Um, mental health services tend to be the kind of thing that people have like a window when they're looking um, and then they're not as interested at some other point. And so when a wait list is six months, often it actually will move quicker because some people ahead by the time they get to them will have either found someone else or have decided they're not interested in the moment. So don't hesitate to put your name or your child's name on it, even though the list is really long and put your name on as many wait lists as, as you can uh, because something may open up for you faster than you expect. Um, there's also some really wonderful um, self-help books and websites and programs out there that do a pretty good job um, in that waitlist period, like when you're holding over. And I know um, there's those, um, some of those resources are available on the handouts um, that you all received. Um, not all treatment is created equal. Um, you know, I think we often, the first question we ask when someone finally does connect with a therapist is like, oh, did you like them? Um, and that's important, but it's not necessarily enough. Um, you know, it's not the question you'd ask like of your cardiologist, like, oh, did you like them? And that's kind of it. Um, so, you know, really be looking for, um, for programs that can point to evidence of success um, and that can talk about exactly what the program is and what, what they do and the science that it's based on. Um, and some of that is in like these books and these handouts and things that you can kind of learn on your own and your child can read and learn on their own as well. It's the same kind of methods that have been tested um, scientifically and proven to work that like you can kind of learn how to do yourself um, you know to some degree while you're waiting for other treatment to open up. Okay. Sarah, what are some ways that our adults can build connections and community with their students and children? All right. Um, I think we've heard a lot tonight that all of us look outside of ourselves for validations and expectations and responses from everyone around us. And that's part of being in a community. And it's natural to do that. Unfortunately, we're in a world where we've detached from ourselves and are outside of ourselves so much. And I wanna read a quote from The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. And he says, being able to feel safe with other people is probably the single most important aspect of mental health. Safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. The critical issue is reciprocity, being truly seen and heard by the people around us, feeling that we are held in someone else's mind and heart. And I think we heard a lot of that tonight from our students and thank you each of you for sharing your stories. Um, and that's really what it comes down to. Are you seen by someone else? The opposite of addiction is connection. And we all have addictions that may not be drugs, may not be substances, maybe thoughts, maybe behaviors. So how do we counter that? Um, I'm gonna challenge the adults in the room today 
that it starts with us. Put our face masks on first. What are we doing? Are we looking at ourselves, as Paul has said, to be the models for our children? When you walked in, there was a flyer I created. This is probably not scientifically proven. Um, it's a narrative theory, um, a narrative practice that you can do in therapy. I've done it myself. Um, but it's actually looking inside yourself and asking yourself these questions and the way of getting connection with someone without them even being with you. And that is taking a moment to think about that person. Who in your life do you want to connect with? Where are they in this moment? Your child, a student, a classmate, a family member. And think about what about them do you love? What about them do you celebrate? What wins them trophies? What do you encourage them to do? And then look at the stories around that. Did your parents bring a pan from India? Do you have Olympic swimmers in your family? Were you a soccer family? Were you an academic family? What stories are you bringing to the expectations of your child, sometimes unknowingly? Are they your stories or are they your child's stories or the student's stories or your athlete's stories? Now look at the behaviors that upset you, that are frustrating, that drive you nuts, that disappoint you. What stories are you carrying into that? Why do you think they're behaving in that way? I'm not an expert. I care about community. And this is proven to me to be the way for connection is to come back to self, listen to those stories, and find a way to be that safe person. You know, find that one person. Love brought me back to the starting line. And I think that's how we're gonna move forward in this, is coming back to that love. And before we talk to our kids, they need to trust us. And before they trust us, we need to trust and know ourselves. Thank you. Is there anyone else on the panel that wants to share something that, that might not, I might not have asked or had the opportunity to share? Um, one thing I think is important to highlight is that we all have stressors. That's a natural thing. And we're all going to have moments where it's been a long, hard day and we're all struggling. Um, and it can be easy as parents and as adults to in our own way, minimize what uh, our adolescents are experiencing a little bit. We pay bills, we have to deal with all of these other more adult things. Students go to school, they get to come home, it doesn't seem that bad. But I think it's important to remember that um, in their lives, this is, this is their whole world, and that it is really big to them, and taking a step, a step back to really think about that, and empathize and validate, and maybe ask your student, what do you need right now? Do you want advice, or do you just want somebody to listen? The one last thing I want to add is so shameless plug, but I'm part of a club here called Active Minds, and it's our first year doing it at Franklin High School. Uh, they have it um, nationwide at college campuses and at a bunch of other high schools as well. And we started a chapter this year, and it's um, destigmatizing mental health is the goal of the club and changing the conversation about mental health. But one of the things that they teach us, and it's for peer-to-peer -peer helping one another and talking about mental health, but I think it can also be really cool if parents use it too for their kids. It's, the acronym is called VAR, so V-A-R, and V stands for verify, A is verify, affirm, and R is refer. Or is, did I say that right? Validate, <laughs> affirm. <laughs> Refer, so yes, and validate is kind of looks like saying that's that sounds really hard. I'm, I'm really sorry you're going through that. Instead of saying, oh, it's not that bad, or you'll get over it. You don't want to say things like that. You want to validate your child's feelings or whoever's coming to you with something. Validate how they're feeling. Tell them it's okay to feel that way. And then the next thing is, why am I forgetting it now? That <laughs> affirm, yeah, and affirm is saying. I, oh my God. <laughs> Affirm is saying, oh, my God, I'm sorry. I just like, like, <laughs> it's getting late. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Affirm is saying it's okay to feel that way. Hmm? Yeah. And yeah, saying it's okay to feel the way. Oh, and saying thank you so much for bringing that. Sorry. It's actually appreciate. It is appreciate. It's actually appreciate, and it's saying appreciating them for coming to you. So it's saying, sorry, it's getting so late. 
<laughs> it's appreciated that they came to you and told you. So to do that, it looks like Thank you so much for telling me. I'm so glad that you chose to share that with me, and I think that's a really important thing for us to do, too. And then the last thing is refer, and that can look like saying, is there someone else you want to talk to us about? And then eventually being saying if they wanted to get additional help, or sometimes that would mean a professional help as well. All right, that took me a minute, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right, we're now going to open it up um, from some, a few minutes for questions. We're, we're at 8.47, so I'm try, try to get you out by 9. Do anyone, does anyone have questions for our panel? Sorry, right before we oh, do the sorry. questions, just quickly. Um, I read a book called Time to Parent. I'm not a parent, but I just wanted to read it. And I think it's a really good book. It's a really good self-help book. And it touched on and, and delved into a lot of the um, things Mrs. Bombardi touched on. Um, so like stuff about like helping yourself before helping others and like other stuff. So yeah. Thank you because my feet hurt. <laughs> you got your seat here. Yeah, I know. Um, so I am a mom of two teenage girls, um, a junior and an incoming freshman. And first, I commend all of you um, for being up there, adults and um, students, that um, I think you're all very brave, um, actually. And you've obviously had wonderful parents that have raised you that have given you the confidence to be up on that stage. Um, to Nicole, your story was absolutely amazing. As I'm sitting here as a parent, I'm thinking how beneficial your story could be to all of our students, um, whether they're incoming freshmen or they're already here in school. I would love to be able to see Nicole come back and, and talk to all of the different grades um, because you can relate a little bit more as a student to a young person than as an adult who said, listen, I've been there, you know, it gets better. You know, what doesn't break you makes you stronger. Um, but um, one thing I'm questioning to the teenagers is, so um, we take our children's electronics at night because we've always heard that was the best thing to do um, so that they're not up all night on their phones, unsupervised. As a parent, I feel like a lot of my children's stress is their phone the social media, um, you know, what, how many likes you get on Instagram, all these. I, I detest Snapchat. Um, I think it was the worst app that was ever of made. Um, I've been to every social media class that's been taught. I could probably teach it myself, though I think that teenagers should be teaching parents all the ins and outs about Snapchat. Um, because all of you know a lot more about it than we do. But my question, long story short, to you is, do you feel that your phones and social media have caused additional stress in your lives? And if you had to make a choice between having a phone because you feel it's the way that you stay connected to your peers or fit in or not having a phone, what would you choose? I think that's a really great, great question. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of us sometimes think, oh, I wish we could have grown up before they had phones. But now, since everyone has a phone, it is important that we have one to feel connected and to stay connected, unfortunately. But I so agree. I hate Snapchat, too, myself. I don't like having to send pictures of my face all day long. It stresses me out. Um, but I also think, too, that another thing, it is super harmful that social media can give kids very unrealistic expectations of people's lives and of people's bodies and the way that people look. Um, but I also think another thing, too, about phones, too, is I think my phone stresses me out more than anything else because I am, yeah, you're seeing what other people are doing. You're getting FOMO. You're upset that you're not invited to something. Or people are yelling at you over the phone, texting you, why wasn't I invited to this? Or people are, there's drama on the phone at night, too, with your friends and your peers. But it's also a way to connect with people. So it's like this 
very difficult love-hate relationship with your phone because sometimes you'll see something on your phone that makes you very happy and sometimes you'll see something on your phone that makes you very stressed. So I think it's important to know when to put it away and come back to the real wor world and make sure that it's not becoming something you're on 24-7. And I know I struggle with that myself. So, uh, oh my God. Uh, and just building off of Audrey, uh, building off of her, um, there's um, a sense of self-discipline to it. So recently my dad allowed me to set my own screen times when he used to set them for me. Um, and like the first thing I did was go to Instagram and set a 10 minute like time limit because that app is terrible. But, um, but so um, I think that there's a sense of self-discipline to it, just knowing that, hey, that's going to like waste six hours today. Um, so it's better if I practice some math or read a book. Um, so as the person who has 300 day streaks on Snapchat, um, I can say that sometimes <laughs> maybe it's not the best, but I personally enjoy it because um, for me, it's a way to also stay connected with a lot of people to, um, to remember them and to like just see their faces. It's really nice. But I also have a 780 day streak um, on my phone for Duolingo. So I think, <laughs> that, I think that your phone can be a very good educational source. You just need to teach your kids or teach yourself how to utilize the tool correctly. So I'd say without a doubt that my phone causes probably the most stress um, in my life. Um, I, when I get my phone taken away, the only thing I can think about is I want my phone back. I can't go without my phone. But I think the other aspect is on social media, you see so much of other people that are your friends or, for example, play the same sport as you. They see that they're going this place, they're going here, they're doing this, they're getting invited here, and you're not getting any of those things and you want to have those things. So I think that um, the phones and Instagram and Snapchat um, obviously cause more stress and more FOMO, like Audrea said, and um, yeah, that's it. Um, to add a little bit to that conversation, I personally think that TikTok is the worst yeah. social media ever, but Snapchat's a fair second. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that kind of what Arsh was saying, um, and especially for me, I know too that um, I'm a very disciplined person and I like to think that I'm almost everyone all of us, I think, are pretty disciplined people. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, 780 days on, on Duolingo is pretty impressive. Um, <laughs> but I think that a lot of, you know, what I've done for myself on social media and that sort of thing is whenever I sense myself kind of, I've spent way too much time on my phone or something, I, I log out. I, like, sometimes need to delete the app. I need to make that step for myself because I know that I can sense myself kind of you know, you like ever see like watch a TV for like a TV like show for like way too long and you're like, I need to walk, I need to go outside. I think that as a as a kid and, and being able to make that independent choice and like Arsh was saying too, like being able to set your own um, timer and that sort of thing. I think that that is, is so crucial because that is, he, I mean, even as a freshman, like I don't think I, I could be doing that. like. Um, you know, taking a step back and really recognizing that um, maybe this isn't what's best for me right now, even though, um, you know, there is that pressure to perform and to, um, you know, have, you know, certain, certain looks and certain likes on social media, so. And um, about, like, taking your kids' devices away at night, I agree that, like, I've definitely stayed up till 3 a.m. on my device before. It's bad. But, um, what my dad is, if you have like an Apple device, you can set a downtime. So my downtime uh, goes off at, it used to go off at 10.30. And then after 10.30, I would only be able to use like some apps like Duolingo, of course. But I'd also be able to play Sudoku or um, like other brain games. So uh, sometimes giving them a little more freedom can be helpful. That being said, you should limit it a bit. But also um, like it took me, like this, this literally happened three days ago. My dad finally let me um, manage my own screen time. And before that, he's been managing mine for two or three years. So, um, and it took me two months for like to convince him to just let me like manage it. Like let's do a one week trial, let's see how it goes. So I think that giving them a little freedom 
um, some experience to be able to self-discipline themselves is very beneficial. Uh, th thank you, everyone, for, for speaking tonight, and thank you, Nicole. Was th I, I really don't have the words, so thank you. Um, I'm also uh, a parent, um, a business owner in town, um, resident in town, and um, before the last question, I think the biggest stressor was college, but now it's social media. I got it. But what I, for I have a comment and then a question, but the comment first is in reference to life after, life after high school, why is the track in Franklin College? Maybe the language around this needs to change and needs to shift because it's not everybody's path. Um, and I think, I think that language is, is extremely important. I think um, the focus on, on college um, is exclusive rather than inclusive um, for a lot of our, our, um, our demographic here in Franklin. Um, and my question is to Dr. Cohen. Um, it's, it's not for me because I'm a perfect parent, but um, you mentioned that, that disconnect um, in conversations, and I think I'm extremely clear with my children about what my expectations are, but I was wondering, um, what are some of those examples of, um, that, that you see those disconnects and what parents think they're being clear with and students not recognizing that or the children not recognizing that or the parents aren't recognizing what their children are actually seeing? Yeah, I guess the, one of the cases I was remembering was um, a ninth grader with ADHD and her parents were really just fixated on that she's doing this to piss us off. <laughs> and it was hard to, to, and she was hurting. And they're not bad parents. They, they were frustrated. They, they thought they were giving all the right messages, but they had the underground belief that she's doing this intentionally and she can sense that. And I agree, language is super important, not just when you're addressing the issue, but all the time you're sending your kid messages about how open you are, how accepting you are of who they are and what they want to be. Um, I, I guess I also see a disconnect where the some parents are reluctant to seek counseling because they feel like it's a judgment on them as a parent if I must be doing something wrong if my kid needs counseling. And that's definitely not true. I think we could all be happier people with counselors if we could just solve the supply problem. Um, and I see kids and parents also doing, saying, well, our problems aren't that bad. People have it much worse. I don't deserve to go to Calor. I, I, I should wait till something's really terrible. Um, so the, those are some of the disconnects that I see. If you want it, that's okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, I know we're getting late, so I'll try to I'll try to be quick. Um, so I also just had a, a comment and a question. So um, I'm a Franklin parent. I have two kids in elementary school. I also am a mental health professional in the community. So I wanted to make a sort of a, a quick comment to this to the um, waitlist issue because I know it's you know, multiple times a week, I have to tell people um, put on a wait list. Unfortunately, I don't have that availability. Um, and so I just really wanted to make a plug to kind of second what was said before of keep calling, encouraging parents to call back. Sometimes things do open up, um, taking a village, looking at other resources. There are a lot of times, unfortunately, when I don't have availability, or I know colleagues don't and will recommend groups and oftentimes people or at least the feedback I get is that people are hesitant towards groups they really want individual work um, but it could be really good while you're on that wait list um, and also being open uh, parents being really open to support too I think a lot of times individual counseling for youths are what I'm seeing the biggest referral for 
and the biggest thing that is, I think, really hard to find. Um, but oftentimes, once I, and, and absolutely, I think um, sometimes that is the need, and you know, I work a lot with adolescents in the community, and I think it's obviously um, really important and oftentimes finding where maybe their uh, family work could be helpful or parent work can also really be helpful. Um, and so going into it knowing that, that's just like a little bit of my plug for parents to know that support for us can be extremely beneficial as well. And I could be wrong, but I would imagine um, for you teens, you might agree that sometimes us parents can use a little bit of help as well, that it's not just about, you know, um, supporting you individually with your anxiety or, or these things that are coming up, but also kind of, uh, from a family perspective, how those things are, are being addressed. Um, and so that was sort of my one comment on that. And then my, my question, going to the stressors, um, I guess I'm curious, again, sort of from my experience working with youth in the community, everything you guys said, right? College, peer pressures, um, substances, you know, social media, all these things. Another thing that I sometimes see in my work, and I'm curious if it's a conversation that happens amongst the students at Franklin High or not, are also the stress from um, kind of global stressors that are present now, whether they be political issues, whether they be um, prevalence of school shootings, gun control, whether it be climate change, kind of these things that are really big for a lot of adults to deal with and that um, adolescents are also needing to kind of, uh, whether it's exposure to this um, content because of the social media or whether it's because of things that you're experiencing. So I guess it's a two-part question of one, do you find that that's a stress that people are talking about? And two, do you feel like there's enough of a conversation between the adults in your life and the teens around issues like that? If so, would that be helpful or not? Do you feel like there are appropriate conversations about that? Um, I know that was like a really layered multi-part question, so I hope it made sense. I'm also trying to be really quick in how I'm, I'm phrasing it. Um, so anyway. Thank you, yes. I think students are very worried about those issues and I like climate change or gun violence in our schools and things too. And I think there are students who are doing things to change it and there are also just students who are really worried or get scared maybe to even go to school some days after things happen around us and we're, it's very, very, very overwhelming. And it, you, I think with the phones too, you see it on your phone too. It's 24 seven news always coming in, alerts of this, alerts of this. And I think that can be so stressful to the point where it starts to make things feel pointless and I think as a generation we've already gone through so much with the pandemic and everything that you're sometimes kids get to the point where they're like this is all pointless and I think that can be a great thing like this is pointless let's do whatever um, let's do what we want to do or this is pointless why are we here what are we doing and I think that's really important um, and a reason why a lot of people need help because of all of the really intense things that are happening in our society around us and so I think it's really important to, um, that we have each other and that's why it's you know having your peers to go back on it's people that are going through something at the same time as you and that they can only relate to it the way that you can relate to it so I think it's very important that people have peer-to-peer -peer conversations about things like that as well and yeah I don't know um also like for example um with the Roe v Wade I know that created a lot of conversation amongst uh, us younglings um <laughs> that was amongst us youth um, <laughs> um, and so like certain events will create a lot of uh, conversation the Capitol riot also created a lot of conversation amongst us um, uh, I think that something for me is that like for what since I was four years old I'm 15 now since I was four I've lived in this town and this is raided right one of the safest towns in the United States so I've always felt kind of more safer in this town. But uh, with the recent events going on too, like the swatting event, and today there was a bomb threat in Mansfield, which is like our neighbor. Um, it's like kind of starting to grow, the school shootings are rising. So I think that there isn't as much conversation as there maybe should be, um, but it is definitely something that stresses us. Um, I think a little bit to Arsh's point, um, like, not to get like big scale scope things, but I guess like politics and that sort of thing, it does uh, manifest itself into, um, I think the high school for sure. Um, I think that, you know, as, as teenagers, it's kind of, you're finding your voice and you're just, you know, beginning to, you know, start thinking the way that you think 
by yourself without maybe so much of your parents' influence. Um, and I think that maybe just because I'm a senior and senioritis exists, very prevalent here, but I think people are sometimes like sometimes are a little bit like rude or, you know, and it's because we're so young and we're still like experimenting and we still like don't really know and maybe necessarily like think about how our words affect others. But I do think that the political, everything that's happening in the world, um, it stresses people out and it makes things sloppy and it makes, you know, smaller interactions and sort of things like that become a lot bigger. Um, I know I'm president of Diversity Awareness Club here at Franklin High and a lot of what I do is, um, and, and what our club does is, you know, amplify um, people of color and student of color voices. Um, and I find so often that that becomes political and that's something that really stresses me out um, because I know that, that the kids and the, and the members of the club um, are really great, wonderful people and um, their identities and their voices are not political. Um, and so that's something that I think that's a struggle that we all kind of go through is like a lot of things are political, a lot of things are controversial and it's hard to um, navigate those, especially as, as young kids who are just beginning to, you know, find their voices and everything. So, yeah, do you have any? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add to, sorry, that was really awesome. I'm totally changing the subject back to the um, wait list problem. Um, Child psychiatry is almost impossible to find in Massachusetts, but don't oh, don't forget your pediatrician, your family doctor. We do have a awesome program called um, Massachusetts Child Psychiatry Access Project, where if your PCP is a um, a member and it's free, um, I can call if I have a kid in my office who's in crisis. I can speak with a child psychiatrist within an hour. And, it, and they will meet with the family once and help direct and they will, they'll help your PCP with, with med management if that's a step that needs to be happening. So that does help with access. So talk to your primary. All right, well thank you. We're past our time now. Um, we do have a number of resources on the table on the way out that I encourage you to um, grab before you leave. Um, also, um, Franklin is in, um, sponsor, uh, well, has a relationship, I guess, with um, Interface from William James College. It's a hotline to find counselors. Um, the number, all our counselors have the number, as well as I believe the fire department and the police department have the number. You can call central office and we'll give you the number. Um, families have found, been able to um, find some providers that accept their insurance. They do all the legwork for you um, and hopefully, and then hopefully connect you with a counselor. So I do encourage you to reach out um, if you do need to find a counselor for you, your family, or your child. Um, so we hope you um, found this evening beneficial. Nicole, amazing, thank you. You are always welcome here at Franklin High School. Once a Panther, always a Panther, so know that you're always welcome to come back. Um, Jen, as always, love you. Thank you for sharing. And how about our student panelists? I mean, amazing, brave. Thank you. Thank you. As well as our other professionals and panelists who, um, who shared their stories and gave their recommendations. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Chris Flynn and his crew from Franklin TV. Thank you, Chris. Ooh. As well as Nick Bailey for helping us with tech tonight and moving furniture, thank you. Um, and of, I would like to especially thank Lily Rivera and Sarah Mabardi for all of your help, um, the partnership and tremendous help behind the scenes that you gave me. To, we could not put this night together and pull this off without both of you, as well as my members of my mental health and well-being task force. Thank you for the planning, thank you for the brainstorming, and thank you all for coming tonight. We hope you enjoyed it. Have a great evening. This program was made possible by your Franklin friends and neighbors. Good folks, just like you. Thanks for supporting Franklin TV. And thanks for watching.